In the first commandment, God says, present tense, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Back in the day when God first spoke that commandment, gave it to Moses, civilization was very, very, very polytheistic. People worshipped many, many, many gods, lowercase g. They worshipped sex and nature and the universe. They worshipped their bodies and money and food. They worshipped pleasure, work, and self-determining autonomy. Their gods were hedonism, consumerism, humanism, and scientism. They worshipped sport and technology and knowledge and power and violence and control and... Oh, no, that's today's list of gods. Back then they worshipped a whole bunch of fertility gods, probably several hundred nature. And into our multi-God world, your multi-God world, God says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Nothing should come before me, God says, because I'm the one who saved you out of slavery I'm the one who gave you new life. I'm the one who loves you more than anyone else does. I'm a jealous God in my love for you. I called you by name. I made you. No other gods but me. And I want you to have life in abundance, and so I give you this command, given who I am in relation to you and what is best for you. I want you to flourish, to have peace, to live with wisdom, to live with a sense of um, confidence about your direction and who you are, your very being. I made you for that. I want you to have hope and to be fully human the way I made you to be fully human. God gives commands to that end, not to put a thumb on your life and wreck everything so that you can't be human. That's the lie. The truth is the exact opposite. And he knows that when we know him, we'll know ourselves. St. Augustine in the fourth century, let me know myself, let me know thee. God. Saint Anselm in the 11th century, I believe so that I might understand. Saint John Calvin, oh no, he wouldn't like that. John Calvin in the 16th century, true wisdom consists in the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. So if you really want to know yourself, Abraham Maslow, if you want to self-actualize, If you really want to know who you are, why you're here, Charlene, what this is all about, and where it's going, God is saying you need to know me. Don't put any other gods before me because I am the direct source of giving you the identity that you need in order to flourish. The one and only God. Don't trust in other gods because they can't save you. I'm God. Worship me, follow me, give your life, every bit, every fiber of your being to me. Which I failed at miserably this fall and only came to realize just before Christmas. I uh, blogged my confession just a few days before Christmas with these words. I think I lost a little bit of focus this fall. I didn't even notice it was happening until recently. Being sick, and I've been sick way too much this fall, has slowed me down enough to see it. For months, I've been unsettled, complaining and stressed out, little energy, wavering passion, disheartened. I've wanted to bolt from my job at least six times. Fran had to lock the doors, 
so that John wouldn't wuss out. Halfway through last night, I woke up praying these words. This is not about me, about forcing the issue, or about making people believe, about theologically defending the cause, about growing a church. It's about you, God. It's about knowing you more, about seeing you more, about loving you more. I've woken up with variations of this realization each of the last three nights. I remember years ago, as God's vision for New Hope Church was starting to unpack itself, all that mattered was the ever-widening understanding and experience of God that it enabled, that it brought about. God was moving everywhere, and my worldview was expanding exponentially, and my faith exploding. And then, somehow, I got caught up in the worldview, in the vision, in the idea, and let go of the end, the only end result. And I was lost and empty, feeling uh, disenergized, unable. Disconnect yourself from the God moment and you get lost and your heart hardens and your strength is sapped and your focus blurs. Then I ended my prayer with a prayer. I don't want to do that anymore, God. I want this to be more personal than it has ever been. I want you to be the end in ever great and exponential ways. I want to know you more and more and more and more everywhere all the time and totally give my life to you to that end. I'd temporarily lost sight of the God, capital G God, and replaced him with the lowercase God of self. This is me, I know none of you struggle with putting self before God. Theology, I know none of you definitely put theology before God, hopefully. Fear, always afraid and anxious and running fantasies of how things are going to go south and how you're not enough. And on the other side, success, a big God. I put my trust in things that I controlled because then I could be God and ended up lost. But God didn't lose me, and I was reminded of that on Tuesday morning in our staff meeting as I shared that blog post and my awakening and my confession. And as I'm almost done wrapping it up, and I look at Heather sitting across on the opposite couch, and she's just bawling, and, you know, so in my good pastoral way, I go, what are you crying about? <laughs> For weeks... I had been praying for you and for our church because she was concerned that her pastor had kind of lost his way, her co-worker, friend. And she'd been praying and praying and praying that that first love would come alive again. This is why Heather will never leave New Hope Church. I'm convinced the prayers of some people No pressure on the never leave. I mean, <laughs> I don't mean that. <laughs> Just not next seven to eight years. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. I needed to be awakened to my propensity toward these other gods, my obedience and subservience to them. In order to be saved, in order to see God again, and to know God as my only God. I think that's the process that played out. And I think that's why God framed this most important first commandment the way He did. I'm the one who saved you, brought you out of Egypt, out of slavery, out of a place you couldn't have gotten out of yourself. Worship me only. When you and I were powerless, I didn't even know I was losing my way. 
powerless. When you and I were powerless and enslaved and lost and out of gas and didn't know where we were or who we were, it's only then that you can somehow be in a place that is humble enough and needy enough and broken enough and screwed up enough to need someone to save you. To be willing to to take God's hand because you were dying on the vine. And it's only as you've been saved and know that you've been saved due to nothing of your own. It, it, It happened to you. It was a gift to you. That you're then able to see the difference between all the gods that you make God and the real God. He He intervenes in a saving way, and the saving action just wakes you, me, us up. And it changes everything. At least for a while, it changes everything, right? Until I forget again. And then Heather has to pray again, and then... (laughs) But hopefully not too quickly. This past couple of weeks, it's better... I'll go into my anxiety fantasy or my anger fantasy or my whatever and start to stress and freak out because my world is not happening the way I created it to be. And then I'll stop before it goes very far at all. And I'll, it's not even a matter of thinking about God and that God is there cognitively. It's like in the thinking about God, all of a sudden I'm before God again and God is present and looking at me. And when he's looking at me in the moment of freaking out, it's like I realize, oh, John, you're not in control anyway. I am. And this peace. It's like the slow switch happens in times of anxiety or fear or doubt or a lack of wisdom. It's not all up to, oh, and maybe not a quick answer, But something changes, even in moments of happiness and goodness and joy. I spent a whole week over Christmas just doing physical labor, installing three toilets, refinishing wood, all kinds of great stuff. And I was so happy. And a couple of times in that process, realizing the happiness isn't enough because you've given me this gift of life and money and a home and the ability to do stuff and a body that's still strong and... My happiness, my mere happiness, was transformed into joy. And what I'm realizing is you're not even making those moments happen. He's reminding me by His Spirit and leading me and you. This is what Jesus has to offer. from the Gospel of John, chapter 15. It gives you an image, a picture of what having God as your only God and rooting yourself in that God could be and look like. I am the vine, you are the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relation intimate and organic, the harvest is sure to be abundant. Peace, rest, wisdom, joy, perseverance, strength, comfort. Separated, you cannot produce a thing. Anyone who separates from me is dead wood, gathered up and thrown into the bonfire. But if you make yourselves at home with me, and my words are at home in you, you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and acted upon. This is how my Father shows who he is when you produce grapes, when you mature as my disciples. I've loved you the way my Father has loved me. Make yourself at home in my love. If you keep my commands, you'll remain intimately at home in my love. That's what I've done. Kept my father's commands, including the first one, and made myself at home in his love. I've told you these things for a purpose, that my joy might be your joy, and that your joy might be wholly mature. This is my command. Love one another the way I loved you. 
This is a bit more embarrassing to admit, but that's changed in me. I can feel it. I love people more. <laughs> I was feeling when you turn inward and become uh, more deadwood and wizened and, and less flexible and tight and hardened. Your heart for other people is not what it should be. And it was like in the rerouting experience into his branch, the branch, the long prophesied branch, that all of a sudden everything got flexible and free and love became abundant. And it was as though I was rooted in some great source of love that could then more freely move and flow through me to my wife, to people in our church. That is the life God wants for you. He wants his love in you to grow for him and his love in you to grow for her and then together into him, together rooted in him. He might have to save you to show you he's God to then do that, but he does. does. He did, right? Earlier, earlier this week, I read an old, old interview with an old singer-writer named Charlie Peacock. And as I read his words, I went, whoa, like they were just hitting me between the eyes, especially the last one. But it's like your spirit God is asking these questions to me, to you. Are you living the life that you are meant to live? And most importantly, do you understand this Jesus way of life only in terms of the way you are socialized, or do you understand it in terms of this ancient, ancient story, this ongoing story of God? Have you stepped into the same story that Jesus stepped into in terms of what God is doing in history? I've been saying that a lot lately at New Hope. You're no less called than Abraham is, Grace. <laughs> you may not be called to his calling, but you are as called as Peter, you pestilent one, as John, you great lover, as Esther, you brave, strong woman. Do you see yourself as an active, vital participant in what God is doing in the redemption of everything He loves? Is that who you are? Because that's a marker for God above all things, worshiping the one true God. You need to know what God's ways of being human are. You need to understand that so you won't create a life that is somehow distant from what God would have you be and do in this world. To do that, to know that, prepares you for being an unceasing spiritual being who lives in glory forever. And then one more, the one that hit me the hardest, messing with me all week. Should you ever settle for anything less than the brightest vision of who God is, of who you are, and of what constitutes life now and everlasting? Should you ever settle for anything but the brightest vision of who God is and of who you are meant to be? Which, of course, made me think of this crazy, huge, world-filling, God-speaking-everywhere-all-the-time vision that we're trying to figure out. We'll never figure out. To me, there is nothing more beautiful and majestic and powerful than a God who is in, through, and for, and moving in, through, and for, and who in, through, and for all things have been made, and through whom history is breathed, and you and I are birthed, and churches are made alive, and, and rooted in Him, and a world grows and flourishes even through the sin to know a God like that. I mean, it's such a beautiful idea, and I steal this from Albert Einstein, who saw a formula, said, this is so beautiful, it has to be true. 
That idea is so beautiful and so God-honoring and so big, it has to be true. Whether we've figured out how it is true and how to do it yet is still a journey. But if God is that kind of God and is saying, worship me above all other gods, the question then is, are you? Will you? St. Augustine said, we either love God first or we love ourselves first. Who do you love first? Honest. And if you say, I love God first all the time, think about that. <laughs> love the Lord your God, it says in another part of the law, with all, with your whole heart, love Him with all that's in you, love Him with all you've got. Write these commandments that I have given you today on your hearts. Get them inside of you and then get them inside of your children. Talk about them wherever you are, sitting at home or walking in the street. Talk about them from the time you get up in the morning to when you fall into bed at night. Tie them on your hands and your foreheads as a reminder. Inscribe them on the doorposts of your homes and on your city gates. <laughs> this morning, for the first time, I realized how beautifully that fits with this God everywhere. Like, know Him in every way possible and put it all over yourself and inside of yourself because you can know Him everywhere. All the time, in all things. Why? Because I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Never ever fail.